together. Where are you going, boy? Never inside. Where are you at? Never inside. Inside. The never inside theory. Are we going outside? That's the theory. Let's outside. Outside ain't easy. The P Bros are back. Okay, thank you for coming back again to the Never Inside Theory. We appreciate you guys coming to watch us again. Pound sign, how you doing? Good, fantastic. How are you? I'm doing great, thanks. And we have our special guest here that is frozen on our screen right now again. <laughs> there she is. Am oh, I? She's back. There we go. All right, yeah, we're figuring definitely this out. on our side. <laughs> definitely on our side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it is not your fault. I promise. Um, so, uh, outsiders, we have a very special guest today. It is Kai Ferno. And did I say that right, Kai? You did, yeah. Okay. I was uh, going through it a little bit. Um, I've known who you are for a long time, as a matter of fact. Uh, Kai was, I know who Kai is from Naked and Afraid. Um, uh, I just didn't, I didn't, I started looking into you a little more knowing that you were coming on the podcast. And I'll be honest, I, I didn't know. What the, a big deal you were. Yeah, I didn't know you were as, as big a deal. <laughs> As you turn like, out to oh, be. No pressure. <laughs> don't, uh, don't trust the internet. <laughs> <laughs> right. But um, again, I appreciate you coming on. Are you, uh, can you do me a favor and just, uh, I can I can go into your resume, but I'm sure I'll leave probably, you know, two, three quarters of it out. So um, anything that you want to explain to our, uh, our guests, um, or not our guests, but our outsiders, who you are and why you're so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a bit uncomfortable for an Australian. I don't know if you know many of them, but we're not very good about talking about ourselves like well, you that. You know, it's one of those. Oh, I know. Like when I used to, when I worked in America, and I'd start to get stunt jobs, they'd be like, "Are you, are you good at what you do?" And I'd be like, "Nah, not really." Because in Australia, <laughs> we don't like to talk about it. And I was losing all these jobs, and I had to start learning how to be like, "Well, actually, I can do that." And you gotta sell but, yourself, yeah, right? Yeah, so I mean, yeah, yeah. we're high pace around here. <laughs> My base, and- <laughs> it's part of the world. <laughs> yeah. So my basic story is that uh, I guess I was an outdoor guide early in my career, decided to become a stunt woman, did 16 years in the stunt industry, did some pretty cool jobs and some of the big action movies at the time. And then when I wanted to start getting back into the outdoors, I headed across the Sierra Nevadas with just a pocket knife. And from that discovery found me and I was, on the first ever season of Naked and Afraid. And since then, I've done four of them. And Four? Um, I didn't realize that. Yeah. And then I um, have done a couple of other TV shows, one with Ed Stafford, who's a um, an English survival extraordinaire. And then I had a, like a mini series of my own showcasing what I did when COVID hit in the outback of Australia. And I do bits and pieces in between. I'm, I'm an author. Um, the are. second most published survival <laughs> author after Bear Grylls. You got one of your books right here. You, so, okay. So I'm sorry. Say Yay. that again. So you're the, <laughs> you say you're the second most, um, say that, say that last sentence again. You're the second most published survival author. Yeah. Yeah. So Bear has the same amount of like, sort of adult books but he does a lot more kids books so um yeah so i've written a few things and i do motivational speaking and that's sort of me i guess in a nutshell that that's awesome all right well it's nice having you on all right well yeah (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) cheers so the the thing that obviously and so i don't i am just learning about you you know luke's been in the the outdoor field with naked and afraid now that much longer than i have and and just in the last couple years i've really um gotten more and more into it and then with the podcast um meeting different people that knew it and and it's been very exciting you you traveled across where with a pocket knife uh the sierra nevadas so uh from west to east in california there um, so like where the john Deere trail is at so is that uh, something like we good we sort of just made our own path you know i think we started somewhere i'm not sure if we 
not very good with names after all the concussions in the stunt industry, but we either started at Three Rivers or finished at Three Rivers and went the other way. Fair enough. And just sort of made our own own trail across, um, yeah, 100 miles in 10 days, just trying to live off uh, the land there. So was that like your car broke down, then you had to get to the other side of it, for, or you actually decided <laughs> to plan this in the living room and then went and executed it? Well, see, one of the things I'm really good at is doing challenges and so quite often people come into my life and they're like oh my gosh you know what I've always wanted to do this and I'm like well what are you doing next week you know and a, a friend of mine <laughs> right was, I like your style. a friend of mine was like I've always wanted to walk across the Sierra Nevadas you know with a pocket knife to see if I could do it and I'm like oh let's do it you know let's do it let's document wow. it let's just and so I think about two months after he told me of his plan I was like right and he'd been thinking about it for about five years <laughs> I was just like I, think we're on the trail like, I, off, off I don't need to think it. about it that long just give me a knife I mean, no, what, exactly. what else is there <laughs> we're gonna figure it out as we get there anyway right yeah well that's what survival is about absolutely that you know what's funny is that uh that is so funny that you well it's not funny it's actually pretty impressive that you did that um so after I did Naked and Afraid um I was I had some interactions with um what's his name uh who's the creator of Naked and Afraid again uh Steve uh, uh Steve Rankin Steve Rankin sorry sorry Steve mm-hmm. he'll probably never watch this <laughs> but Steve <laughs> so so I had interactions with Steve I know Steve um and I had an idea for a survival show and um I sent him the the NDA to sign so I could tell him more about it and stuff like that. And because I, I was hoping that he you know he'd like the idea and make it into a show and I could be a part of it. But um I was gonna call it and you know, if someone wants to take it and run with it, fine, whatever. I'm I'm over it. But <laughs> he w- I was gonna call it Surviving One Hundred. And Right. Oh, okay. The idea was exactly what you did. Because because my yeah. concept was there's so we they've got like naked and afraid and it's always this set amount of time um, and all you have to do is be there not die and you you basically made it through the challenge right um, but you're sitting in one spot and you have the opportunity to to build your life to to create everything you need to survive on a daily basis and uh, in in that scenario that um that you already have actually done which is just a a a concept in my mind um you have to survive still but it it takes time to find food to build shelters to find water and and purify it and all these things so um that's what seemed to me would be the most difficult part of it is covering the distance while still performing all the survival techniques to keep yourself able to cover the distance Right. So I'm, I'm actually very mm. curious to hear how that went for you. I, I, I didn't know you did that. So I'm going to have to go find your documentary that you did on it. But um, I'm curious how that went for you. Um, so we didn't end up putting the documentary together. Oh. Um, the, the guy that I was doing it with and I had some creative differences. So I've got like little bits and pieces of footage around, but okay. um, it, I didn't get the, the doco done in the end. Um, but you know, I mean, it was it, it was interesting you should say that because I also pitched an idea like that to Naked and Afraid and they're like, oh, yeah, interesting. Oh. And then about six months later, they did a Naked and Afraid where they had the people moving while they were surviving. <laughs> they, they, oh, they jacked you. I also pitched one where I'm like, we should do it on a raft. Like, that would be one I'd love to do. And then again, six months later, they, they did like one with Joe Maynard, who was on a raft going from <laughs> island to island. <laughs> you got to be careful. Like, huh? I'm like, yeah. I'm not giving you any of my ideas anymore. Yeah. But, um, yeah but, maybe that's why he didn't yeah, want to sign my NDA. <clears throat> 100%. And it is the truth because um, traveling and surviving is really difficult. You know, like there is a reason that when they say, if you get lost, stay exactly where you are mm-hmm. and part of that is if you're moving the rescuers obviously can't find you either because they're going to be tracking behind you right. but it, it gives you that time to do what you need to do to survive and and the thing people don't understand is why you can put a 21 day show into an hour is because those repetitious things that you do every day to survive take up most of the day 
but you know that is your food you know trying to hunt for food but firewood water collection building your shelter and all that sort of thing it does take a lot of time and and it's incredibly boring to watch if they put it all in in really what we're point. doing um it's just too yeah bad. so i mean yeah, go. I was going to say, it's just too bad they can't figure out a way to get every cool thing you did into mm. that 42 minutes of, of footage, right? I mean, we, yeah. I spent half of my time climbing a ladder that we made out of out of pieces of bamboo to get coconuts that, you know, half the time is falling apart on us. Um, it, they never even showed the ladder once. They never showed me <laughs> getting a coconut from the from a tree hey. once. You're like, that's boring. <laughs> So yeah, that's that. That is a. Like they don't like to show successes either, you know. Like they do like to make it look like you're struggling out there. That's probably the for sure. the hardest thing for me about the show is, um, I'm like, why don't you show the the amazing times, you know? Like in the Amazon when I'm alone and like a storm's raging outside and my <laughs> shelter's completely waterproof and trees are falling down but there's fireflies in my shelter everything's and, going according like, to plan wild <laughs> right and you're sitting out there and you're like you just go who gets to do this like this is phenomenal and <laughs> and those moments i wish would get in there more you know yeah. and that sort of the yep. joys and successes but um yeah so i mean it was really tricky in the sierras like and also i didn't didn't have probably the level of skill that I needed to do it. Like um, I learned that I needed to learn a whole lot more. And I didn't realize the Sierra Nevadas were so strict, you know, like it's cattle country. Oh, so as far as got, regulations um, and the, stuff. Well, no, it's just as far as animals and oh. plants, you know, like the cattle have trodden in the ground so much that it's really bare. There's not a lot of edible foods there. Mm. Um and it's been like all the animals are very human shy. They've been very pressured. So, you know, we barely saw an animal that we could have hunted anyway. So mm. we sort of made it across the Sierras on um, a couple of meals of stinging nettles and a few handfuls of wild raspberries and some rose hips and then these two tiny little fish that we managed to catch. A hundred miles? And, and that was really it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you had a hundred miles on that? Yeah. <laughs> Holy crap. Yeah. Well, <laughs> by the end, I was just running and my butt trying to hold my pants up. <laughs> <laughs> Man, well, it's unfortunate that you weren't able to get that documentary made. I mean, it sounds. See, to me, that that seems like I wouldn't call it the ultimate challenge because there's a whole lot of difficult challenges out there. But but it seems like a really a lot more difficult than naked and afraid. You know, just just getting that distance alone. That that was the hundred part of my name you know is a hundred miles yeah it's not that far to walk if you've got food and water and all that and shelter and all that stuff you know i've hiked further than that more than twice that but yeah and how long did it take you to get all the way through it 10 days 10 days um and you and you're right because each night you have to stop way before dark to make sure that you have like some kind of shelter because it was also um i can't even remember what time of year we did it but um in the mornings, we'd wake up and there was ice all over our gear, you know, so it was below freezing at night. And, um, you know, quite often you'll see on the fan pages, like, why don't people make two long fires and sleep between them? I mean, and firstly, <laughs> it takes forever to, to grab that amount of wood. Oh, my gosh. But when yeah. you're traveling... Like when you're traveling, you can actually manage to find that amount of wood. Like I'm sure you know yeah. on your challenge, like you start and you're collecting wood here and then it gets bigger and bigger and you end up having to range miles to get right. burnable wood in, in a lot of cases. Whereas when you're traveling, you're just like, well, it's all right here. And you just make these two long fires and sleep between them. And that sort of saves us a lot of shelter building time in the end as well. That so, makes a lot of um, sense. You know what I mean? Yeah, little things like that. Um, you just have to think like, how am I going to get through the night and how long is it going to take me to make something to get me through the night? And um, I learned that all these A-frames that people build are just so ridiculous for survival scenarios because if you're in like a freezing cold environment, your head or your feet are going to be cold, you know, mm -hmm. like just the way you're lying. And then if it rains, there's, it's almost impossible to cover that middle Arch. So if you read any of my survival books, I'm like, never build an A-frame. Like, <laughs> don't. You're crushing that myth. Bust, busting that Busted, myth. Right. Uh, well, 
well, this is the thing. It's like a lot of people make an A-frame in an ideal environment and they make it out on their survival course and everyone's like, yeah, look at this beautiful survival shelter I've made. And I'm like, I dare you to sleep in it for a week in the Amazon and then you tell me how amazing that survival shelter <laughs> is, you know? <laughs> like, that's, that's sort of the different thing about my book is I've really tested these things in every oh, yeah. environment and I'm like... That works. You're, that doesn't work. <laughs> you're definitely not talking out your ass, and and there's not a person on the planet that can say you are. <laughs> so so you did you did naked and afraid four times. Um, yeah. You were on the first season, you said. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, so I I thought that you were on the season that I was on. Were you on season four as well? Was it the shark episode one? Um. It was the, uh, I was, I thought you were in the, the, um, like in Louisiana or something like that in the, that was season one. That was season one. Yeah. So that was, yeah. So they put six pairs out for that first season and Billy and I were the finale of season one in Louisiana. Okay. Yeah. Okay. For some reason I thought that was the same season as me. I was season four, but, um, and then I did shark, the first the shark one. week special in the Bahamas. Um, I didn't see that one. And then I did. Then I did like the first season of the Alones, even though they're saying that this solo one is the first season of Alones. We did a whole season prior to that where they put eight of us out alone. Really? Um, and yeah, and then I did the Frozen one just recently. Wow, you're hard Frozen one, man. You're hardcore. I kind of, I'll be honest, and and don't take it personal, obviously, but <laughs> I don't really watch the show anymore. I just have. I don't do watch it. I've never watched it. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? I That's know. funny. <laughs> there you go. You're like, okay. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I feel well. I feel out of the loop sometimes. I talk to these other naked and afraid guys for whatever reason, and you know, everyone's talking about everyone else like by first name, and everyone seems to know each other, and they all, yeah, they go on these these uh, trips where everyone gets together and Belize or whatever, and it's like. I mean, this sounds fun, but I mean, don't these people have lives? I got, I got better stuff to do, you know? Well, not, that's not cool stuff to do, but I just have important things to do in my life. I'm, you know, not paying attention to the naked and afraid. So it's the time to take those little, I go, so I mean, I'm the same. And I just recently did this Frozen one and everyone's like, yay, yay. And I'm like, I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, I felt so bad. <laughs> like, everyone's like, hey, hey. And I'm like, mm. Like, yeah, they want you are to you be. crew or are you cast? I don't know. <laughs> it was terrible. That, that's awesome. Um, what do you think about this new one that just came out? Th uh, this this uh, last man last standing. One standing. Um, have you? It, yeah. It, so they they go ahead. They they really like. I had a big meeting with myself and Gabby in Los Angeles trying to get us to do that one. Really. Um, but to me, it goes against everything that survival should be you know mm. like I feel like survival is about working together to be the best that you can and I I don't I don't care if I'm the best I don't need to prove it to anyone I've hated the ego that's come with it's a weird thing a lot of these ego survival about. shows yeah you know it's survival is you a, know and in real life survival is just a personal thing all you're trying to do is just get out of the situation Right. And and then now it's mm. because it's a TV show. It's who's better at it. It's like, come on. Well, well I mean, if you made it through, then you it's a success, right? Yeah, we're all, I mean, we're all still nobody alive. died, you know? So, <laughs> you know, I guess that's a, a positive thing. Yeah. And I've really fought against that elitist mentality since the very beginning, you know, because a lot of people are like, yeah, you know, do you know who I am? I've done naked and afraid. And I'm like, I'm like, so what? You know, like, good for you. That's amazing. But it shouldn't be the thing that you then hang your hat on for the rest of your life. You know, like, yeah. I just think anyone can do it. Anyone can sit out. And and the fact we're on, what, season it's like, 15 or yeah, something. Yeah, way up there. As, has proven that anyone can do it. If you can put up with pain and suffering, you can sit out there for 21 days and survive. So I don't know. I've just never liked the ego associated with yeah. it. So when I, it came out, they were doing a competition show. I'm like, no, like it just went against everything that I believed in for survival. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's good that you have a, a feeling like that toward it, um, or, a, 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 a attitude like that toward it rather. Um, 
I hadn't thought about it that way. I just thought about it like like the show alone, you know. Uh, I've always everyone always asks me, "Oh, you should go on alone." And it's like, well, first off, it's not that easy. Just go on a show. But, <laughs> yeah, it's like you just got them lined up, and then you just choose which one you want to do. Yeah, but uh, secondly, it's like that's that was always the one. I was like, ah, I don't know, because I mean, I I think that I would do well there. But the problem is that you don't know how long you're doing it for, and that would drive me insane. That was the that was my least favorite part of Naked and Afraid was just just uh, waiting for time to go by and it's like you know we all like to think that we're these epic survivalists that are going to have um that are just going to be spending all my like every given moment improving my situation but i think we all know that after a certain period of time and and lack of food and stuff that, that energy just, just waiting it out huh? it's just not there all the time especially as you get further and further into the uh the challenge and um you know, t so so you're sitting there a lot of the time, even though you maybe want to get up and go do something else to better your situation. You're sitting there and you're there's no books, there's no TV, there's no cell phone, <laughs> Facebook. You know, you're you're just sitting there thinking, and that time goes by real slow. So the idea of sitting there and not even knowing how everyone else is doing, think, okay, am I the last one now, or is there still nine people there that I'm going against? And is it, that would just drive me insane. Dude, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine. So, <laughs> so I'm a, a, a body piercer, right? For, that's my, my job. And, uh, I recently, one of our piercers in the shop left. So I recently am actually working eight hours a day. Typically we're four hours a day. It's, it's a beautiful thing. And so now I'm just by myself feeling all in. And, and it, on those slow days, I just sit there and I have a computer and I have a, a kitchen and I have the bathroom <laughs> and I have my, my iPad and I'm just sitting there like, oh my God, this time, like, I'm so bored. What am I going to do? And I hear you guys. I'm like, yeah, I probably shouldn't ever say that again. Yeah, that was, you know, that's the worst part to me. <laughs> I'm just like, how does anybody do this? Uh, how do people work eight hours a day? <laughs> how do people work eight hours a day? <laughs> it's just, well, it's most just, people. It just seems cruel and unusual. And let me, I'll, I got an answer to that. Most people work eight hours a day. Well, no, yeah, we're not doing <laughs> So, you know. I did for a long time, so. Um, so, so around here, they, and you may know the uh, Reality Rally. Do you know what that is? You ever heard of the? Mm -hmm. oh, okay, do you participate in those things? And you know, no, you're not because I know Luke's done it a couple times, and it sounds like a just a big party. But um, yeah, I wonder if you had gotten a part of that. I guess that's not your thing. Well, I mean, I most of the time I'm out in the bush, to be honest. You know, like I'm not, <laughs> I'm not really in civilization that often. So, um, and then most of that stuff happens in America, and I've sure. been back in Australia, sort of. For a while oh, now, okay. so, okay. I just, so I mean, so yeah. being in Australia, I have to say Australia has always been one of my places that I'm going to get to someday. You know, I just haven't quite gotten there yet. I've done some traveling, but that's just not one of the places I've I've made it to. Um, you're obviously from Australia, correct? I would yeah. say that by the the accent. <laughs> yeah. I gave it away. Yeah. So what when you're you say you're out in the bush, you just you just like to get out there in the outback and oh, okay. uh, how'd that sound? Did yeah. That sound? I've never asked an Australian <laughs> never asked an Australian how my my accent sounds. Would would I pass? What your Texan accent? <laughs> your Texan accent. <laughs> well, you, <there> you jackass. <laughs> <laughs> well, because you nobody's ever asked her that before. How's this go? <laughs> is this believable? <laughs> I'm not going to do it <laughs> my, <laughs> for that reason. My favorite is like, people are like, you're Australian. And they're like, g'day. Right? <laughs> you know, that, that's not a knife. I am so that's glad. Knife. <laughs> I am so glad I didn't say either of those things. Throw another shrimp on the like, <laughs> You guys are like, what is wrong with you people? <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so you've been, you've been, you know, we had to do that at least one time during this podcast <laughs> to have that conversation. All right, check the box. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get back to the Australian bush thing because I'm, I'm in, like genuinely interested right. about what what it's like to um, to be in the bush in Australia. But because we're on this topic, I have to ask real quick. So because you're you've been in movies as a stunt woman. Um, have you ever had any speaking lines in, in these movies? Well, see, I don't think I'm an amazing actress. Like I'm a good stunt actress and I'm, I can chat to people as myself on reality TV, but one time on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., 
I had to go up to Agent Colson, who's um, I don't know if you guys uh, big. My big, wife's gonna trip out. I'm like I, a I've watched big. the whole the whole <laughs> thing because my wife likes it. So yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Right. And it's crazy to think that I saw you and didn't even know it. Right, and I had to just go up to him and say, "Sir." And I was like, this that is was my it? only One word? speaking. Right. And, and I was like, am I asking a question? <laughs> You're all like, way like, overthinking am I, it. Have I like, I'm so flustered about this whole like, just being like, sir. You're like, sir. <laughs> sir. <laughs> sir. <laughs> sir. <laughs> How many <laughs> takes did you have so to do? <laughs> <laughs> a couple, <laughs> it wasn't my fault. It was a big scene. <laughs> that is awesome. That's pretty funny. Did you, now, did you sound I mean, American? Uh, probably. Who knows? <laughs> I've sort of put on a, you know, my Australian accent dulls when I'm over there to make sure that people can understand me. So I probably did that, roll the R a bit for an American. But uh, <laughs> it was just so, it was so funny. I was like, this is why I don't do lines. <laughs> so you've done quite a bit because, because, uh, well, I mean, I don't, that doesn't mean you've done quite a bit, but you've, I, I know Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is a, a fairly recent show, right? That's only been like the last five years or something like that. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, I I did a lot on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. as Lady Sif, you know, mm -hmm. the uh, warrior goddess. So she made a couple of appearances on there and I doubled her on those times. And then I was my own character for a bit and I was meant to have like a bigger role, but I ended up being double booked on something and I had to go and do the other show. Mm -hmm. um, so that would have been good. And then, you know, I've, I did the Avengers, I doubled um, Marie Maria Hill or whatever, the... Um, the person who's second in charge to Samuel L. Jackson. Um, oh, cool. So um, I doubled her and, you know, I mean, obviously I did Lady Sif on Thor and, yeah, so, I mean, I I did. A, I was really fortunate enough to do a lot of big action movies and sort of finished off my career with that movie, uh, TV series Blind Spot um, with the girl with the full body tattoos, the FBI oh. agent thingy. Okay, okay. I kind of... Yeah, so it was most recognisable because she had like the full tattoos and she had amnesia and she was like meant to be a Navy SEAL and all that sort of thing. So and I, I had a fantastic 16-year career there doing some really, what really cool action career. stuff. Yeah, that's cool. That's super cool. <laughs> yeah. Who's the, who's the biggest <laughs> actor that you were a, uh, a, a double for? Well, I mean, I doubled... And Hathaway and Jennifer Garner and Sharon Stone and those sort of sort of up that level. Anyone who was about five foot eight and <laughs> had some fight sequences, I generally tended to do the stuff. Do for you them. have some martial art background because of for that the fight scenes and that's everything? Well, when I started to get into stunts, I had no sort of. I, I was an outdoor guide, so I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do all the abseiling and rock climbing mm. stunts and things like that, and there's just none of them. <laughs> so <laughs> right. I, um, I realized very quickly that people my height in Vancouver were all gymnasts, and I was never going to be an Olympic-level gymnast, so I just started training fighting. And I trained mm. you know, almost every day for three years with weapons and different martial arts techniques, and that's how I got into the industry in the end. Wow. So most of my stunts were either big wire smashes like I was sort of known for being able to get smashed up and then get back up again and do it again and again <laughs> wow. so that was not a good thing to be known for but it was sort of you know yeah, my niche, niche right? there yeah, and, yeah, she, she's, yeah. she's great at getting the shit kicked out of her she, <laughs> yeah and there were like stunts where you know like it's a stunt when you have a car driving crazy along the street and people are at a cafe table and they get up and they go ah like that's a stunt day too but i never get those i get the ones where they're like okay we have to do a triple wrap through the air and smash <laughs> someone into a concrete wall 20 meters away let's get kai in great. <laughs> no pads <laughs> don't worry let's put her in that tiny little outfit with, <laughs> with bare arms and legs she's a professional she can handle it <laughs> she's Australian. She's yeah, yeah. Up again. <laughs> she's from the outback. So, do you have like a lot of? <laughs> yeah. um, obviously, you're you're well known in the industry. Like, like right now, are there is is there a several like a lot of different opportunities, and you, you have to kind of pick and choose which ones that you want to do. One's better than the other, or you just take what you can get type of thing. I mean, I imagine at this point. I mean, I don't do stunts. Yeah, I don't really do stunts anymore, oh, okay. and sort of. 
um, I, I, I retired out of that, like mainly because of, you get a lot of concussions <laughs> yeah, you mentioned and that, I was yeah. starting to worry about, she yeah, remember. starting to worry about my <laughs> mentality. <laughs> I thought it's a good excuse when someone's like, I've met you before. And I'm like, like, like oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> concussions. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Concussions. <laughs> um, so I, I sort of started moving out of that industry. Um, and as, you know, as Luke was saying, when people are like, oh, why don't you do that? Sure, this show, you know, I mean, I'm not at that level of fame. I could be like, hmm, I'll do this one or that one. But I do, I don't do every opportunity that comes my way. You know, I have a sort of set of values that, that each adventure has to fit into. And so quite often I'll say no. Like, I mean, I don't like the 40-day excels because, again, I don't like the egos involved with that yeah. sort of situation. You know, I don't like 12 people out there naked. And <laughs> just, I, I'm just like, it's, it's now a naked put it that way. camping it's a trip, you know, <laughs> and I'm just like, I just don't, it's not what I want to do. So I all, I've always said no to the excels with, a lot, a lot of people. Mm. Um, I do sort of pick and choose in that way, but it, yeah, it's not like, hang on, let me just work my way through the start <laughs> right. of the things that I can be doing. Get rid of all this riffraff <laughs> over here, so I can get to the good stuff. Yeah. When you started out, did you yeah. just take what you could get, at, like at the beginning of your career? Um, in stunts. Um, look, I mean. I have a philosophy that I'm not going to take the job unless I can do the job. And a lot of plan. people would just take any job yeah. and then try and learn the skill in between the job day and like getting <laughs> the job. And I just, real quick. <laughs> you know, yeah. And I was like, if I commit to something, I want to do the very best I can. So if it's not something that I feel would work for me, I won't like, you know, I've had jobs where someone's like, Oh, I need you to do like a round off back handspring in these high heels wearing this <laughs> outfit. I'm like, I'm, I'm not a gymnast. Right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, like, and so I, can, I could do a round off back handspring at that stage, but not wearing those high heels on that <laughs> outfit. Just a on a amateur set, round, so, round off back handspringer. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, and same with TV challenges. You know, like, I'm not desperate. I'm not desperate to be on. TV right. that I'll compromise my own set of personal yeah, values good for, you. for it. That's so cool. you know, like I love I love the challenges and I do really enjoy the challenges of just getting out there and and like being one with the environment. But I didn't want to do last one standing because it, it went against what I believe in life we should be aiming for. That's awesome. Good for you. Um lost my train of thought. Uh so <clears throat> but Luke, I just wanted to tell you that you can, they don't let us do alone. They don't let Naked and Afraid participants oh, really? do alone. So they don't do a crossover. No. Because oh. personally, I, I would have loved that challenge. Um, I love being alone. It's <laughs> one of my favorite places to be, especially in the outdoors. And uh, on my Naked and Afraid alone, every day they'd come out and they'd be like, tell us how it feels being alone. I'm like, oh, my God, can you go away? Like, I love it. <laughs> yeah, let me show you. <laughs> yeah. Turn around and walk away. <laughs> what happened to that season? They just they filmed the whole season and just scrapped it? No, it's Oh, out it's out there. there. Why, why do I feel like you were talking about one oh, that yeah. never got released or something like that? I don't know. I've... Well, they they did they did the... They called it Naked and Afraid Alone, and then people just kept getting the name mixed up. So then they did another season they're just releasing now, and they've called it Solo, oh, okay. which is a great idea. But then they've gone, this is the first time anyone's ever attempted being out there for 21 days <laughs> alone. Like, and I'm like, hang on a minute. This, like, yeah. <laughs> was, You're like, what, what am I, chopped liver? <laughs> there was a whole lot of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like. I was the only female that didn't quit on that season. So, you know, that was something, a real source of pride for me. And now I'm like, and you're just like dismissing it. Like we never even wow, went out yeah. there. Like, Yeah, that's that's rough mm. to be alone for that amount of time. It takes a certain person for sure. Um, th th oh, I love That's it. what I wanted to get back to was the, so, so when you go out into the quote unquote bush, when you're uh, where you live, what does that entail? Like where, where are you going? Are you going just 
you know, all I know, and, and it's funny because you're talking about the the common phrases that Americans have about Australia, like the, every Australian supposedly says, but, but like, what, so all I know is from the same movies, you know, what Australia looks like in, in Crocodile Dundee and, you know, whatever, but like, what do you do when you go out in the bush and what kind of terrain is it and, and so on? See, that's the beauty about Australia. Like most Americans don't know Australia. If you put it on top of America, it's the I same I did know side. that. Yeah. So, um, it's huge. Yeah. So a lot of people I speak to, they think it's like a tiny little island. Like somebody told me one day that they thought they could drive around it in a day. <laughs> you know, so it is well, a, Kauai, it's a massive road. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're like, well, there's like that one-way road that just goes around it, right? And you can get from one side to the yeah, other yeah, in, like in three weeks. an hour. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's it's huge. And you just have a lot of different terrain associated with that. Like just from where we span across um, the planet, you have down south in Tasmania, we have snowy mountains mm. and sort of even into Victoria, which is down south, there's the snow and the temperate climate. It's very England. That's where a lot of the English people came and settled um, due to the rolling green hills. And then as you move up, the centre of it is just this red, red desert with huge canyons and and just gorgeous, stunning little hidden water holes and places where, where people suspect there's nothing. There's this, you know, when you get into it, it's, just the most incredible red earth landscape and then you know you have on the sides you have amazing tropical white sandy beaches but then as you get north you get into jungles so you've got thick jungle like you would get um you know some of the most the oldest rainforest on the planet is up um northeastern australia so um yeah in the dane tree so you've got this beautiful kind of mix of anything you want in Australia depending on where you go and and so that really depends on what I'm doing sometimes I love exploring the rainforest and jungle area and you know I have a rooftop tent on the top of um, my truck and just that yeah that was basically home for you know two or three years just traveling around on that and sometimes I'll be on my motorbike like I've got motorbike kit and I lived on the back of my motorbike for a year and a half as well so you're the real deal just um (laughs) <laughs> oh, just, I don't know. A year and a half on a, <laughs> uh, that, on a motorcycle is pretty. It's pretty hardcore. That's, uh, is it? And is it? Is yeah. I mean, it, is beautiful. it you by yourself a lot of the time, or do you like with a partner or a couple, couple, three people, or what's it? What's typical for you? I mean, I know you sound like you, you like to be alone a lot, but is that <laughs> is that most of the time? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, the motorbike was by myself. Um, just. You know, I woke up one day and I just decided, like, I had my motorbike over here and I was like, well, I'm just going to see if I can live off it for a couple of months. (laughs) And then it just extended and I had some great adventures and met some amazing people. So that was sort of that one. And then uh, the rooftop tent, the last three years has been with my partner. So we we just sort of travel around, go where the work is or just go where we want to go, go hunting. You know, we both bow hunt. So if we want to head somewhere to get some feral animals here, you know, go to a deer or pigs, you know, we'll sort of go depending on where we want to go hunting and, and what adventures we want to have. So just sort of go with the flow really. But it the the terrain ranges, you know, from from yeah, red deserts to tropical beaches to beautiful waterfalls and then green rolling hills. That's beautiful cool, here. Man. Sounds That's like you're super cool. Living the dream. So <laughs> I feel like I am. I mean, you know, I know a lot of people that would kill for that. I mean, shoot, I would kill for that if I was still single. You know, I got a family, so it's a little different. <laughs> you know, before before the family, I would I would 100%. be off doing whatever, whenever, and I yeah. I missed that a little bit. I love my family, but I missed yeah. that a little bit. Not gonna lie. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I, I sort of forgot to have kids in that stunt bit, and then I'm like, nah, it's too late now. So I'm quite content with the choices I made. <laughs> Yeah, that's cool. Um, so, so do you have any experiences that have happened out there that were less than ideal? Like, do you have, uh, you know, I've been listening to this other podcast called the John Frickin mirror pod. And he, he says, he asks a lot of things that, that always resonate with me. I want to, um, remember to ask the same things. And, and he, he calls, he calls this, uh, is it type two fun? I think he calls it, uh, 
it's basically where you've got a story to tell where you it was pretty much like shitty situation for you but it's like the best story ever to tell so you look back on it it was fun but uh when you were in the moment you're sitting there wondering if you're even going to get out of this thing alive you got any you got any scenarios like that you want to tell us about you see it's really interesting because someone asked me the other day like what's the time where you took a risk where um where it went wrong and i'm like my brain doesn't think like that like you take a risk and then you have the outcome and then you make the most of the outcome. Well, you know? so I mean, that's the way you kind of have to you know, live never, that way, right? You know, since we've been interviewing a lot of people and, lot, you know, out, outdoors and people that we do, that seems to be the, the general idea. Because you've asked that question to other people that we've interviewed mm -hmm. before. You know, what's, what was the worst case and how did you deal with it? And, and it seems to be like, well, you just go, that's what you're doing, right? You go out there to just see what it's going to be like. So whatever happens was mm -hmm. meant to happen and and that's where you are and then you just you deal with it accordingly i guess you're kind of out there looking for it when when you mm -hmm. live like that you, huh? you, you almost kind of keep an open end uh you know and just keep it open to what's going to happen and just just go roll with it my girlfriend and i do that we go to the local and, bar and, and I, drink a bunch of beers and then see what happens <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and let me tell you i got some really good stories because I of that you, have some wild <laughs> I mean, you know you yeah. wouldn't think but if you're open to like you know to anything i'm gonna go out on a limb and say you probably call that yeah. type one fun uh, well it's uh, listen it's been kind of <laughs> sketchy sometimes okay i'm like okay not sure how we got here but we're gonna have to figure out how to get out Right. Especially when when you're waiting for him to yeah. open that cell door. I mean, exactly. I mean, exactly. Like, okay, <laughs> we pushed it a little too hard this time. <laughs> you call the wrong person for your one phone yeah, call. That's right. that's <laughs> exactly. Um, can you hand me that real quick? Yes, the book. I mean, and, and I feel like when you've done Naked and Afraid as well, your bar is like so high as to what's really. It's a good point. <laughs> yeah, that's, right. like, that's a good point. I, I don't know where I don't know where you were for your challenge and what happened to you. Like were you in a I'll nice be honest, location? Uh, and I say it to every you know, obviously you know how it is, everyone asks you about it and, and everyone I talk to, I say it to I, I got extremely lucky with my with my location. Uh, I'll be the first one to admit it. I was in Cozumel. Um, I don't know if you know where that's at. It's like a little island off off Cancun. Yeah, yeah. It's oh beautiful. God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, so oh, I wasn't uh, yeah. on the, Sorry, the fun sure, side yeah. of the island, the type one side of the island. <laughs> <laughs> I was on the other side of the island. And, but it's yeah, it was still beautiful, but it was like sharp, jagged rocks with waves crashing. on. It wasn't like you could go in the water. Um, and there, but there was lots of sea snails stuck to the rocks everywhere, which is our pretty much our diet for the whole time. Um, but it was, a, it, you know, mm -hmm. it was like a hundred degrees and, and humid, but that was like the worst thing we had to deal with besides mosquitoes and stuff, which is pretty standard. Um, so, so yeah, I had a, I had a good location and I'll be honest. I, I watched when I used to watch naked and afraid a lot, I watched like the, the Amazon ones, like even like after I was on the show and I really, now I, now I understand what it, what these people are going through. I, I watched like the Amazon ones and stuff like that. And, and you did the Amazon, right? Uh, and it's like. Yeah, I don't I don't know that I would have made some of those locations, you know, just because maybe the bugs alone or, or whatever. But um, four times out, I'm guessing you've pretty much experienced all the locations, right? Decent ones, shitty ones. Well, no, I just <laughs> you know, like that's the thing is like, in like, you know, Louisiana, we didn't have like people sort of say that's probably one of the worst ones they've seen, even though they've done like over yeah, 200 episodes now you know we had no dry land yeah no dry land for nine days we had the bugs we had chiggers we had leeches um we had the reptile mating season with the alligators and the lot of snakes and you know i mean it was and it was freezing it was the coldest may on record of course it so was. you know like we had yeah, we had everything happening at once in that location. And I remember one of the producers saying to us, like, you know, we can't show everything that happened to you because people wouldn't believe you lived through it, you know. Wow. So they don't show the half so, of so it. So we didn't even see yeah. the, the and, good um, stuff is what you're saying. No, because, you know, like they've got EJ on that first season getting a little splinter out of his foot and screaming. <laughs> well, we, we oh, had... EJ, he's so dramatic. We had such big... Oh, we had such big holes Ugh. in our feet 
from um, we got trench foot. I remember, I remember and that. all of the yeah, all the black um, the black palm thorns. We we just had these big holes in our feet as well as trench foot. And every morning and night, we'd have to lie there and the medics would pour peroxide in these holes oh in our feet and scrub them out using a nail oh brush God. to, like, try and manage it. And I'm like, and he had a prison, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but then, That's and, awesome. You know, but we didn't scream and cry. We just sort of gritted our teeth and, like, just, like, sweated it out to try and get through this That's cleaning so of our feet each night. That's um, so funny. Do you know EJ? Yeah. But... No, not personally, he's actually a pretty no. cool guy. I've hung out with him a few times. Haven't met him. Yeah, yeah. He's come done the he's reality rally nice. thing before, so I've had chances to hang out with him. But yeah, he's a cool guy. Yeah, uh, yeah. But he and he's really great on these shows because he's very expressive. You yeah. know, I always say I don't know why I end up on these shows because the harder something gets, the quieter I get. So you're not like you're not going to get any reaction from me because of my time in the movie industry. You know, like if you had broken a bone and you still had to do that stunt, you just gritted your teeth and did it and didn't tell anyone about it. You know, so that's sort of where I end up going. Um, but yeah, and then we had the leaves, and everyone's like, "That's great," and I'm like, "Yeah, the sand fleas are worse than mosquitoes." Mm -hmm. Like the only way we could avoid them is all night we would just walk up and down it waist deep in the water all night just because if you were any closer to shore the the sand fleas will get you and you know like it was that was a brutal location and then i was put in the amazon which everyone knows is like yeah bug city and you know they they didn't show the ticks and the leeches and and you know like all the different ants that would bite you and the, yeah, as well as the mosquitoes. And so I think Montana, Louis, like Montana in winter, I was just like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So yeah, I've never had a, a location. I was like, this is beautiful. I love it. <laughs> I guess I got, I got lucky with my one and done, huh? You know yeah. what? I would have done I would have done more times. I had a couple opportunities to do XL and I just it just wasn't a good time in life. Like I had just bought my tattoo shop one time and then my kid had just been born the second time and I, then they stopped asking me. But yeah, I gave you a couple of tries. Right. No, bu right. bugs are it, man. That is my like God, I just can't do the I mean, I do. Like, you know, you see me just camping, you know, a mile away from here and I got the whole net thing over my head. Yeah. And I'm just trying to keep the bugs off me. That's just, it's just the worst. <laughs> I just can't do it. I can't do yeah. it. I mean, I mean, I'm the same when I'm at home. If there's one mosquito, like, <laughs> that, that funny? yeah, I'm the same way. But you get out there, you're just like, ah, eh, you don't really have much I guess of a you choice. Just suck it up. Right? Well, it's like you can sit there and, and lose your mind over it, but you're not going to change anything. So you just got to suck it up and just kind of figure out how to get over it um, or go home. <laughs> that's or go home, the biggest right? thing. That, that's the biggest survival mentality. I'm like, can I change it? All right, I'll change it. If I can't, I suck it up. Like, that's just. The difference between surviving yeah. and not is looking at what you can change and what you well, can't Well, that's what change. I tell people too is, you know, everyone's like, uh, like, oh, uh, was it horrible? Was it terrible? Did you make it? And I'm just like, it really shouldn't be called naked and afraid. I always say it should be called naked and miserable because that's really all it is. You know what I mean? Yeah, you're not really afraid of it. <laughs> I mean, you, you got to know, right? Yeah. You got to have the basic survival skills and, and stuff to be able to, um, you know, feed yourself and drink water and, and not, you know, get dysentery or something. But once you've done everything you can do, besides continuing to try to improve it here and there, like you're really just sitting there being miserable, trying to ride out the time. Right. So. <laughs> so yeah, you should have uh, been out there with Gabby and I, um, Gabrielle. Uh, I know who she is. I think yeah. you say her last name is she's, um, yeah. So Gabby and I were paired up on um, the Frozen XL one they did um, in Montana. And we had Joe as well, but Joe got medically tapped part of the way through. But Gabby and I had the best freaking time. Like we, everyone sort of says how hard that one was. And we walked out of that just like refreshed as if we had a holiday. <laughs> like we had an absolute blast. And like, 
Again, I wish they'd show the bits because, you know, like once it got to about 4 p.m., it was too cold to be outside. And we'd pull our little door in and we'd like, we had a, made a sleeping bag out of this bison hide. And the two of us would like snuggle under the sleeping bag and just giggle, <laughs> like and laugh and chat like we were having a slumber party, you know. And we, uh, we walked out of there almost wishing that it had been a bit longer and that we had more time together. Like it was. So yeah, that's, much cool. that's cool to have an experience like that when you're supposed to they're supposed mm-hmm. to be torturing you and you're just like laughing it off <laughs> making best friends yeah that's <laughs> yeah that's why they don't show any of us like you know you go through that because they had four groups out there you get miserable 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 you guys and are then <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great they wake so up like, you've been they, you've been yeah, awake in the morning yeah, yeah. two hours you already got like i don't know what the equivalent of a coffee is when you guys are out there and you're just like hey sleepyhead <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. When our producers would come in in the morning, they're like, everyone's so stressed whether they're going to find their cast dead at the end of the, like, when they get there in the morning. Like, they're so stressed whether they're going to make it through the night. And they're like, all we can hear from you guys is, like, (laughs) singing and laughter when we walk up. (laughs) Like, we know we never have to worry about you. That's awesome. Just leave you alone. Come and snap a picture every now and then. Yeah. Yeah. Still alive. (laughs) Yeah. So how yep. how does all of this all these experiences like um, relate to the book, right? So you have two books, you've written two books, more than two, right? I've got, I've got oh okay, five Maybe out I just heard now about I think, and I've got a sixth one coming in August, and then a seventh one next year too. They just keep wanting me to write them. <laughs> so um, so obviously the experiences um, translate to knowing about this enough to write a book is there so did each and i don't know anything about yeah. them so i apologize um i don't know how to read so i don't read books <laughs> no, no, but uh so <laughs> each of each of them no have a, um, uh, a goal behind them or is it just to tell a story well the first one um was called girls own survival guide and i wrote that before i ever did a naked and afraid um it just came out after my naked and afraid but that was i got sort of a bit annoyed because um you know women are amazing out in these survival scenarios and i really do think that's what naked and afraid to the world. Yeah. like they thought we're going to put six guys and six girls out there and the guys are going to kill it and the girls are going to be needed to yeah. look after and they were so surprised when the girls just kicked it out there you know like and men were knocked on their butt for the first like five or six days because we are you know, we only need one man to continue the survival of the race, evolutionary <laughs> wise. You know, so women, yeah. women have pockets of fat that keep us going in those first critical four or five days. And, you know, like a different um, relationship with pain and suffering. Like we really do have these differences sure. within us that mean women do really well in that first four or five days. And men require more calories mm-hmm. to keep them going, like bigger muscles. More attaboys, more, calories. more you're yeah. doing a great job, <laughs> all that. Yeah, no yeah. doubt. <laughs> yeah, we need some more pats on the back. But, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> but it's, it is an evolution thing. Like, but then after those four or five days, men can, like everybody's body sort of balances out and then, you know, that extra muscle comes in really handy and having, you know, that sort of, you know, that different mentality kicks in and then it evens out. But Discovery didn't know that and they were really surprised. But then I was reading a Dilbert cartoon and Dilbert was like, (laughs) hey, you know, like I've got gold, yeah, I've got gold shares and I've got protein bars and water in my basement. What are you going to do when the world ends? And the female went, oh, I've I've got your address. (laughs) And I was just like, hey, you, (laughs) me. Perfect, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it's just. So I wrote Girls Own Survival Guide, which was just outlining of survival so it's more about a it's more about the mental aspect of survival and you know it is a book for everyone but both the publishing companies that published it in the u.s and australia picked it up and and market it as a female survival oh, that was your book. First and it you know i mean it has urban yeah so it has urban survival tips you know how to run in high heels and all that sort of stuff you okay. know i mean it's a keeping in mind it was written 10 years ago 
So, you know, everybody's wearing high heels now. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> true story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But, um, back then and you know so i had sort of things for for women encouraging them to embrace what makes what makes women amazing in emergency situations and then i didn't write another book for ages and then about two years ago um a publishing company just came to me and they said they wanted to write the ultimate encyclopedia um of survival because the sas survival guide was sort of written ages ago and they wanted to update it um and I'm sure they reached out to a ton of people, but I was just like, and it was really intimidating, you know, because again, being Australian, I'm like, wow, I mean, I don't know anything about survival. <laughs> and then I, I sort of, I sat there and I'm like, well, I don't really know many people who've tested themselves in every environment, you know, like ever since I was a kid, I've been testing myself. And so like in, in all environments, and I just thought, well, yeah, I don't know many people who have that. And so I just um, decided to try and write it. And I sat down and that's, that's the, the red book. Right here. And it's thick. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and that's like 650 pages. Book. And I wrote it in five, five weeks. weeks. So it was Holy just crap. like, wow, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so, yeah. you know... As a an amateur survivalist myself, I'd call you more expert, me amateur. Um, I know a lot of this stuff, or at least I know the concepts of a lot of this stuff. Um, I, I feel like I probably know a lot more than the, your average person. But is everything in here in this book, and you, you don't have to be honest if you don't want, <laughs> but is everything in this book something you already knew? Or did you, I'm guessing, have to do a little bit of, of research for certain little things? You're like, ah, I know a little bit about that, but I'm not sure. Maybe maybe someone's got a better technique for this book that I could do. A... Um, not for the not for the outdoor section. That was all. I've done this. I've, I know this. Like this is the stuff that comes naturally to me. Um. And for quite a few of the natural disasters, I've also done stunts in that mm. sort of field. And I've done um, previous research for a Nat Geo show called When Disaster Strikes. Yeah. So I was the survival disaster person for that. Um, so you do know, just generally know what so you're talking knew, about on most of the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And if I had to research it, it would have taken Didn't me a lot, lot yeah, longer. Sure. And yeah. what I did <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what I did do is I looked at other survival books to see how they set things up and decided I wanted to do nothing <laughs> like what they had. Because the opposite. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So my first assumption is A, anyone can survive with the right mentality. I agree with that hundred percent. hundred percent. If you've People got to realize what they have, yeah. what they're capable of. Right. Until they test it out. So if you get positive attitude, hope and good adaptability, problem solving skills, you can survive anything. Um, and then I don't assume that you have any kit with you. Like a lot of books are like, when this happens, you grab your knife and then you use your knife to do this or you use your fire yeah. starter to do that. And I'm like, God, like, chances are when disaster hits you you're not going to be expecting it otherwise right. it's just a camping yeah, trip well, you know yeah. like so so i don't assume you have anything in anything so i always just start from scratch and the basics so that's another reason it's a bit different and again you know i've done that in so many different environments like i know that you can dig a hole in the snow and survive overnight without any other shelter or sleeping done, bags because yeah. they did it. You know, cool. I did it on first the real man deal. out. Yeah. So, and the other thing that really frustrates me is quite often you'll have experts because everyone thinks if you're on Naked <laughs> and Afraid, you're an expert, no. but you, you're not. You know, like you, you can get by without being an expert. And then, so when you are on these shows and you're like, this is how you do this, you've got to drink your own <laughs> pee now. You know what I mean? Everybody goes like, everybody's like, well, that's a fact. It must be true because that person right. on TV said it. And there's so much misinformation out there from 
amateurs being just because they're on TV and saying something, yeah, right, and saying something in an mm. assertive way. And I'm like, well, like I just wanted to help clear up a lot of that misinformation as well. So I didn't put anything in that book that I That's hadn't good. tried That's myself. Awesome. That's um, real. That's interesting that you say that because I've been in, yeah, in sales sure my whole works. life, right? Up until even even piercing, I still sell the the after <laughs> spray, right? I mean, I've been in sales forever, and uh, I got good at it when I could just fill in the blanks. Like if somebody would ask me something about whatever I'm selling, if I didn't know, boy, you wouldn't know I didn't know, right? So I would I'm quick to on my feet and I'd fill it in. Like, right. I'm going to make it up right now, a fact, right? Closer. I just I just made a fact, and <laughs> yeah. you need to believe me. So if you say it with the right tone and the and in with right. confidence, then I'm like, oh well, this guy knows what he's talking about. And that's, and that's and that's what makes you a good salesperson, right? So right. so I can see that you see these people on TV, and we. I guess I assumed that, you know, Luke had, had, had been camping for a long time, you know, before he went on the show and knew about it and has taught me a lot, um, that they kind of vet the people that are on this show in some they, way, though, right? I mean, you have to yeah. have a certain level of competence to, to even be on the show. They're not going to put somebody out there that has no idea how to survive. Well, I guess I guess what it really boils... Yeah, like, what it really boils down to is how well can you make it sound like you know what you're doing? <laughs> right. <laughs> because yeah, I sure. had no business being out there. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So and 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 even as naive as I was, I didn't even realize I had no business being out there until after I came home. And you made it. Though, and I made so it. you're like, okay, I mean Yeah. And and, right. and it's funny because so so to give you a little bit of my own background before Naked and Afraid, I've always enjoyed camping and that's pretty much it. <laughs> so, so, but. you know, like, I've, like I'm a backpacker, you know, so I've hiked, I've done long hikes. Like I hiked the John Muir Trail, um, which is over 200 miles. Um, and yeah, yeah. so it, plenty of experience being outside. Um, but as far as like the survival techniques in general, they were literally like um, at that time in my life, I was I was sitting there with my my roommate, Dane, and we were we were always in the camping. But at that moment, we were really into going on YouTube and finding um, traps to make, you know, deadfalls and, uh, and how to start a fire with a bow drill and how to start a fire this way and that way. And, and um, just all these things. Right. So we would we would learn these things. And then we'd go out like on a weekend backpacking trip and, and, you know, test some of them out and stuff like that. But it would never be like a, a real survival situation. Right. So I made myself sound really cool <laughs> <laughs> to get on the show. Uh, and then I got on the show. And, and then when I'm watching the show later on, I realized they, they, they've actually made me look stupid. <laughs> but I kind of made myself Aww. look stupid, but I didn't realize it at the time, right? So, because because they're right, you know, it's like okay, I meet. Do you know? Were you, did you ever survive with Alyssa? Uh, her last name's I don't remember what it was then. It's Ballastero now, I think, or maybe it was then. Anyway, she was my partner mm -hmm. on, the, on the show. Um, but we, we, you know, we meet, and then we're like, okay, we're gonna go figure out our shelter or whatever it was. You know, I'm pretty sure shelter is what we went for right away. And um, we're walking down the beach together, and it, this is the part where we're getting to know each other, right? And she's like, so what's your experience in, in survival? And I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm pretty well-rounded. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, most of the stuff I know is from watching YouTube videos. And me and my friends would go out for three or four days and try this stuff out. So, I, yeah, I'm, I, I think we should be pretty good. You know, I'm, <laughs> she's like, okay. And, you know, and as I'm watching this with my my uh watch party you know my my episode release party at the bar you know it, it, you know i'm watching it and the, they're doing the music like wah 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 <laughs> like <laughs> this guy does no shit and, and then you know they make sure and pick just the right camera clip of her going oh Wait, no you know what i mean and it's just like it it's it's pretty funny uh I made it obviously. And, um, but it, oh, it, it just goes to show you like, just because I'm on TV as a survivalist <laughs> doesn't mean I know that doesn't mean I'm an expert survivalist. I'm still, you know, I've done it and survived and still far from being an expert survivalist, you know? So it's like, my friends are probably going to listen to me, but I wouldn't recommend anyone beyond that group. Listen to, to my advice because I'm really just kind of making it up as I go along. <laughs> Fair so, enough. Yeah. It's uh 
But a little bit of knowledge is dangerous, right? Absolutely. That's what they always say, you know. And I always find, like, the more I know, the more I know mm. I don't know. You know, so I've written that whole book and there's, I could probably write three more that size and fill it with survival stuff mm. that I learn along the way as well. You know, I mean, it's a, um, I always find that it's a really easy way to tell who doesn't, know anything is they're the ones that are talking <laughs> about yeah, yeah you know like, the truth in, in, in all of life like, for sure yeah yeah absolutely. and it's and it's fascinating to me and i mean i always say you can have an army survivalist go out there and die in two days and you can have a, a granny with her knitting needles out there and she'll have made a taj mahal in three months that she's sitting there waiting for someone <laughs> to rescue her you know like at, at the at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, you don't know what you know and you don't know what you don't know until you get out there and put it to the test. And it's interesting you should mention traps because that was one of the biggest things that got me super annoyed was if you Google what is the best trap for the jungle, everyone right. will say a deadfall. That's all, yeah, it's always the first thing that pops up. Everybody on the internet, a deadfall. Yeah, and then you look at the way they've set it up, there'll be diagrams and everything and it's set up to not actually spring properly. Like the way so the they stick lands or the land, rock lands on the other stick, falls, huh? it's gonna, Yep. Yeah, and it's not going to trigger properly. And if you've ever spent any time in the jungle, the one thing that most jungle areas don't have is an abundance of big, heavy rocks. <laughs> they, they just don't. And so then you can start looking at, mm. okay, well, I can put logs, but most of the logs that have fallen down are rotten because you're in a really, really moist, damp environment. And then you're like, well, the floor of the jungle as well. The floor of the jungle is really soft. So it's yeah, because it, it just push it into the ground. Either because Instead of you just sort of, it. and then the little thing yeah. just crawls away. You know, so it's like it's not an ideal trap for a jungle environment. Yet it's the first one that pops up every single time because yeah. nobody's tested it. You know, they've all watched YouTube videos where someone set it up in their backyard or in like an area where they've gone. You know, they've gone out to for the day car car like camping or having a picnic and they've set this deadfall trap up right and they, but but then like they've made it look like they're right. professional and they've learned from someone who's learned from someone who's missed something about where you put the trigger stick and and then these become our experts and you can die from that you know like that kind of misinformation when someone ends up out there with their life on the line you could end up yeah. in real trouble from it so like i remember seeing a four-wheel drive show and they were like if you're in the desert and you need water this is what you should do and they had the guy dig a big um like water a solar still mm -hmm. right and then at the end of it they showed him drinking like a <laughs> cup of water out of a so plastic bottle like <laughs> wet sand Right. And he just drenched himself like in the hot sun, digging this hole. And I know for a fact because <laughs> I've done it. Like you get about right. that much water from it. So your yeah. water output as far as and then your water that size. input. Yeah. But he had like right, he had millions of viewers on YouTube that if they were stuck in the desert, they're, they're gonna, gonna start die. trying to dig that hole and they <laughs> yeah. are going to die. Dehydrate themselves. And, right. Yeah. Like, that's the danger with it. Yeah, we're not just doing like, oh, these supplements don't work or like drink these and you'll just pee them out. Like, it's, in these are situations where so-called experts with the wrong knowledge could lead to people dying. And I just think yeah. like, oh, so that was sort of why I ended up writing that <laughs> Well, it's that a cool book. Um, I've, I've only looked at little certain things and, and skimmed through it. You know what I mean? Um, speaking of the book, I wanted, uh, what's that's that? That's what it's for, really. It, it's just like there's people who've read it from cover to cover and fair play to them, but I just really yeah, wrote it yeah. as a reference. Well, no, it's book. great. I mean, it's so to me, this is the, the perfect book to because I'm not I'm not a huge reader because my I think I might have a bit of ADHD. My freaking I can't focus for long enough, right? To to read long books, but something like this is great because I just open it up and like, oh, what to avoid? Um, and it's That's got all these, thing, these right? pictures <laughs> pictures of plants that you don't want to eat. So I can open this one page, sit here and look at this. I've learned something, put it away, and and it's just, bam, I know something else now. And so this is, a, this is a great kind of book to have. It's great for having, like, while you're just regular glamping, you know, just camping, car camping, and 
and <laughs> you know you just need something to read and, and then you just know something else that's going to keep you alive a little bit longer every time you close that book so i think i think that's really cool but i wanted to um mention so so on on our website neverinside.com we've been stocking these things um uh, for a, f a few months now right it was when you you sent them over to us um and uh, number one, I wanted to apologize because we, we haven't sold any yet. <laughs> <laughs> we, but, have, we have one holding up a table in the, no in the kitchen. <laughs> in kind of the, the, no, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Thank you for that. You did too. sell one because I, I actually pulled this one out of the box because I because I wanted one for myself. So I'll, I'll make sure and get you the um, the money for that. But um, what I, I did want to give you an explanation on that because because <laughs> it's it's not because we just don't know how to sell things. Um, we well, had, we had some issues the jury's out on that one too. Well, so. <laughs> it's questionable, but, but we had, uh, it's been a long road, but with our website, we've had all these issues and we got shut down on Google. They, uh, basically because we were trying to sell knives. Now we pretty much can't sell anything. Like they pretty, pretty much told me I will never be allowed to market anything on Google again because I'm the devil apparently. Yeah. And uh so anyway oh, we're we're working around he's it. kind of a bad boy but things like <laughs> <laughs> things like this uh like this podcast having you on the show uh i'm really hoping we'll we'll help uh sell these things from our website obviously for you but but um i just think that it's a good thing for people to have uh if you guys are watching and you want to check this thing out uh neverinside.com it's on there you just go type in survive you'll find it in the search thing um I see how much are these things going for. Looks like we're going for about thirty bucks. Is what is what you're selling them for? And uh, um, yeah, this is thirty on the back here. So we'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to Australia. I think it's fifty Australian. Gotcha. So I'm well, not sure how much US. Forty but, Can Canadian. Um, Canadian. Okay, there you go. Wow. Would Canadian. Canadian. Well, I mean, even though you're not selling them, they are selling really well. Oh, yeah, good for you. Good. For me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, so don't spend more into, time, you know, taking the other outlets out to lunch and stuff because <laughs> we're just not put, we're not holding up our end of the bargain here at all. No. <laughs> maybe maybe now. Uh, they, we'll start. We'll start getting them sold. It's yeah, they went into reprint about a month after after being printed, which is great for me. So, I mean, it's a book. For our time, I mean, mainly the natural disaster section, you know, like as whatever's going on yeah. on the planet, we're all experiencing far more um, natural disasters. So there's a whole section on like learning what natural disasters are in your area and how to be prepared. I mean, it, as much as you can be sure. prepared for the unexpected. So I wanted to make it a book for everybody, not just people who were already going into the outdoors or were interested mm -hmm. in the outdoors. You know, there's stuff about hobby uh like outdoor pursuits like boating or um hiking and hunting and so you know if you do any of those outdoor pursuits there's just stuff about how to be prepared for the unexpected so that you know your situation doesn't turn into a survival situation so that's sort of another another good reason to to have it there and there's an urban survival section too which i feel like we're needing more and more like just look what happened with the whole covid oh, yeah, and then yeah. riots and all that sort of stuff it yeah sort it's of definitely becoming more relevant well. um do you, you go ahead no i was gonna make a joke you have something serious i'm sure <laughs> <laughs> mine can wait yeah your jokes usually are pretty good are very good at all so we'll just go ahead and go with my real question do you <laughs> do you have um is there any one or you can do more than one if you'd like but one thing in this book that when you that when you're writing it or when you're done writing it you're you're like there's that one spot in there that I wish everyone would get, would make it to at least to read that one thing because it's just so cool or such a or important or such a or something that that means a lot to you or something I, I'm I know it all does I'm sure the entire book does but um, is there any like one thing that stands out that you want to make sure that that anyone that uh, gets this book in their hands um, should definitely go check out. I mean, I think the most important bit is the psychology of survival. You know, I'm all about the fact that the mindset is the most important thing with survival. And I think it's just interesting to look at why some people survive mm. and why other Chapter people two. don't, you know. And, and if that, yeah, so that chapter, and that's a chapter that not a lot of survival books had in it. Like they'll discuss it lightly, but 
there's so much research at the moment going into why some people die in days and other people last for years, you know. And I think the important thing about that chapter is you can use mm-hmm. it in your everyday life you know so it's not just necessarily when major survival life or death emergencies happen but it also helps you look at when unexpected things happen in your day-to-day life and how you're dealing with them and how to deal with them better so I think you know that chapter is particularly sort of near and dear to me because you can it makes use a whole it lot of sense everyday I mean, life pretty much everything in life is it you know you're you're dealing with some form of, of surviving the day you know, <laughs> there's there's a lot of tough things in life mm-hmm. that have that have nothing to do with yeah. physically being out in the wild surviving, but you're literally Shame into that, just right? surviving. Yeah. I mean, we've all had a rough day where we feel that way, huh? Well, yeah, and there's all this stuff like research about the fact that you know we've come from this area of where fight or flight gets triggered in life or death emergencies, and now we're in situations where fight or flight's getting triggered in non-life or death emergencies but the body response is the same and the mind response is the same to that as well and they're also like looking at the fact that perhaps we are so used to having life or death scenarios that we create drama within our own lives to stimulate that that feeling of being alive that we used to get in like in tribal primitive scenarios that's like it's- that's interesting that you say that because i i can i can definitely see well guys just like in life and in survival podcasting never turns out exactly as we planned so we lost kai at the end there but it's okay it was a great podcast thank you so much for coming on kai please subscribe 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 go check out our podcast go check out our website go check out freaking our clothing go check out our fire starters uh anything outdoors you need neverinside.com uh we love you thank you outsiders let's outside thank you again to all of our outsiders please check out our website neverinside.com for all of your gear and you can reach out to neverinside on facebook and at neverinside on instagram let's outside